Good evening. Welcome to Denver Open Source Users Group. I am Daniel Hillenbrand, the organizer of Denver Open Source User Group down in the Denver Tech Center. Uh, first, I'll go over some of our sponsors. Uh, Pure Source has uh, provided us with uh, liquid refreshments. They are a national technology IT, technical sales, and accounting rec recruiting firm. So uh, give them a call if you're looking for people or you're looking for a job. Uh, Thrive Workplace, where we're meeting tonight. Uh, Flexible Office Workspace Solutions. And uh, thanks, Matt Rabel, for getting us connected up here. Okta Developer, Auth for All. Quickly deploy Auth that protects your apps, APIs, and infrastructure. Don't let your friends write your own Auth. Okay, Agile Learner, that is Venkat Subramanian's site. Um, Instructor led online live classes training videos, and state-of-the-art technologies. No fluff, just stuff, of which Craig and our video person are a member of, or they present a lot there. World-class training for software developers and architects. And uh, we have JetBrains, essential tools for software developers and teams. And I think that's about all before we get started with Craig tonight, so thank you for tuning in. Thank you everybody for being here. Clap, clap, clap. And uh, Alexa, turn on Craig Walls. I'm sorry, she's muted. Can you hear me, Alexa? Are we on? <laughs> here, let me uh, bear with me while I get settled here. I'll just do this. And I, I trust that Matt will tell me if I've got this completely messed up. Is that, is that good? Cool, all right. So my screen just went weird, but I guess that's switching something. That's fine. All right, so we're here to talk about the talking app, an introduction to developing Alexa skills. So before I go any further, I have to explain a word on this slide. You may not have, may not have heard this word before. The word skill in the context of Alexa is an application. It's like when you go to, an app, to the app store on your phone and you download an app. Skills are apps for Alexa, so just kind of get that settled. Um, but this is who I am. This is where you can email me should you have any questions. Of course, the best time to ask a question is when you have it, especially for those folks here in the room with us. Uh, feel free to ask questions. I may pause, I may finish a thought before I answer, but I'll, I'll try to get to you. But we'll also have some time at the end for Q&A. Um, and so I guess the people at home can ha ask questions then. In, yeah, in the comments, you can write a question. And cool. Answer, yeah. yeah, that'd be great. So the people at home can right into the comments and we'll get that question to me eventually. And then here's where you can follow me on Twitter. Now I have several Twitter handles, but this is the one I most commonly use. So at Habuma is where you can find me there. And I'd appreciate it if you followed me and liked this and told everybody how awesome this was when it's done. Unless you don't like it, in which case you're probably spending way too much time on social media. So anyhow, okay, with that said, the plan for this session is quite simple. I want to show you everything you need to know to develop an Alexa application, a voice application for Alexa. However, I am going to fail at doing that because I don't have that much time. It takes me several days to cover everything. And most likely, as I'm doing this, I'm going to make mistakes. There's going to be a lot of live coding. I'm going to do a handful of slides and then I'm going to sit down. I'm going to start writing some code and show you how that works. And I'm going to make mistakes. So. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to show you as much as I can in the time we have. Which, by the way, I never settled. How much time do we have? 90 minutes. That's what I thought. So yeah, we're not covering it all. I thought not, not 90 days. So OK, 90 minutes. That'll, that'll be fine. All right, cool. But why voice? Now, before I go any further on this slide, I'd like to ask just one or two of you, even the, the folks at home, feel free to type into the comments and they'll, they'll read them to me. Why, why are you interested in this topic? What about developing voice applications is interesting to you? And then I'll talk about why I think it's interesting. Anyone? Go ahead. To create a more responsive environment. To create a more responsive environment. OK, what do you mean by that? Um, I use Alexa to turn on my appliances, my lights, uh, music. Using Alexa to turn on lights, appliances, music, things like that. Okay, I see what you're saying. Cool. Anyone else? Now I know almost nothing about it, but uh, hopefully I'll learn something here. 
All right, so we got two people, not, one person saying it, one person nodding. Know almost nothing about it, but you're hoping to learn something about it. Cool. Anyone at home? It's become oh. very common because of uh, you know, smart TVs and stuff. They're accepting Alexa commands. Right. It, yeah, it is com becoming quite common. And you're right, smart TVs, that's one of the coolest things. Is, uh, if, you have a, if you have a fire stick, or like I have in every TV in my house, so yeah, you can talk to it. You can talk to Alexa on that. Even if you don't have any other Alexa devices, you can talk to Alexa there. Cool. Does any, anyone at home have anything they'd like to offer? Uh, nothing yet, uh, but apparently the streaming is working well. According to okay, the very good. Cool. Well, let me tell you why I enjoy voice, why I think it's an important topic to get to know. I think it is the next <coughs> natural step in user interface evolution. If you think about the the user interface that we've worked with when, we, when humans are interacting with computers, for as long as we've known, we've always been doing it on the computer's terms. We've, you know, punch cards. We've typed on a keyboard. We've used a, uh, a mouse or a touchpad, touch screens. And all these are great. And just like none of these really re replace the others, except maybe the punch cards. They went away for the most part. Um, None of these really replaced each other. Voice isn't going to replace those things either. But it's going to be another way, another option for interacting with applications. And it is very natural. When you think about voice interfaces, there's nothing for a user to get to know. Because they talk to each other, talk to pe each other people. They, it's a very natural form of communication already. As long as humans have existed, starting off with grunts up to you know, me standing in front of you and speaking, people have talked to each other, listened to each other, and that's how they communicated with each other. Why not have humans speak to applications the same way? It is also hands-free, which has become very important over the last couple years to be as hands-free as possible, but it's also hands-free in, in, in another way. When you think about um, you know, people who have disabilities where maybe they can't type, they can't see a, a screen. And even if you don't, even if those people who are disabled in that way, even if you don't know anybody like that, none of your users fit that mold, think about yourself. Everybody is disabled at some point or another, in some way or another, at some point or another. And I only have to go back as far as Thanksgiving to recall when I needed to do something, I needed to interact with an application, and my hands were literally in the turkey. That was not a good time for me to pull my phone out. It was a bad time to pull my phone out. And yet I could still talk to Alexa during that time. I could still interact with an application during that time because she would listen to me, and I could talk to her and listen to what her response was. It fulfills the promises of science fiction. It, from when I was, and, and I'm getting quite up in age now, but when I was a little boy, first time experiencing science fiction on TV, the first computers I ever saw were computers that people talked to, and they talked back. And very specifically, I'm thinking of the Enterprise computer on the Starship Enterprise. They would talk to the computer. But then we have other examples. You have uh, HAL 9000. You have Rosie the Robot on the Jetsons. You have, I mean, I, you, you have Iron Man's Jarvis or Friday or whatever uh, AI he's speaking to, or I guess he's dead now. Moment of silence. All right, but you know, you get the idea. There's, there's in science fiction, computers were things we talked to, not things we typed at. And we are finally at a point now where we can do this. And I picked on the Enterprise for, t for two reasons. First off, that's the one thing I remember from being very young and watching Star Trek and seeing humans interacting with a computer. Interestingly enough, the engineers at Amazon, that's what they talk about when they talk about their, their vision for Alexa, is the ability to give that same experience as the Enterprise computer. And it's just fun. I kid you not, I've done, I, I, my career has, has spanned a handful of decades, and uh, in that time I've done a lot of things I've really enjoyed doing. I'm a member of the Spring engineering team, and I love Spring, I love working with Spring. 
And as much as I love developing with Spring and doing things like that, and I'm not saying anything bad about it, this is still way more fun. I'm sorry, it is. It's just so much fun working with voice. It's just, you're gonna, you're gonna enjoy it. I promise you, it's so much fun. And I got this quote, I pulled it from an interview that Mark Cuban did for Amazon a couple years ago. The URL's there at the bottom, if you want to take a screenshot and remember that, because I'm going to switch off of this a little bit in a moment. But he says, there is no future that doesn't have ambient computing or voice activation. It's, it's, it's just, we've already got it. We're, we're here, we're, we have this now. We have Alexa now, we have Siri now, we have Google Assistant, we have Samsung Bixby. We have all these different voice assistants now that we can speak to. The future has been set. We are going to be interacting with voice. And one of the other things that Mark Cuban said in that interview that I, I thought was terribly interesting is, if you are even the slightest bit interested in this, now is the time to get into it. Because right now, and this was two years ago, by the way, I still think that it's still valid, but now's the time to get into it because voice is at a point right now where you can do amazing things with it, and yet the expectations are really, really low. They don't expect you to do amazing things, and so, but you, yet you can do amazing things. And so now's the best time before people start expecting amazing things from you. Now's the time to get into it and get to know it. So the voice user interface landscape. There's Alexa, Google Assistant. You've heard me mention Bixby, Cortana sort of took a different turn a couple of years ago. Uh, Siri, bless her heart. Siri, I, I, I hope nobody from Apple is listening to this, or maybe I do hope they're listening to this, because, man, she seems to be getting stupider every time I talk to her. Uh, it's like I'll say, hey, Siri, set a timer for 20 minutes. How can I help you? <laughs> set a timer for 20 minutes. OK, how long? 20 minutes. OK, 30 minutes, starting now. And it's just, <laughs> every, it's just getting worse. I don't know. It used to not be that bad. But bless her heart, I, I like Siri nonetheless. I still use her for timers, um, even though they don't work well. But with that said, my main interest, the, the, where I spend most of my time when I'm dealing with voice is I'm talking about Alexa and I'm talking about Google Assistant. And the main reasons for this is that both Alexa and Google Assistant, in my experience, have both the best developer experience and the best market share. So I'm not just developing stuff that nobody's ever going to use. I'm developing stuff that people might use. I'm not saying people are using my stuff. I'm just saying they could because there's a, <clears throat> a bigger market for those two things. Bixby has a great developer experience. And yet most people have never even heard of it unless they have a Samsung phone. And even some of those people haven't heard of it. So. Um, I love their developer experience. It, they, they have some great um, stuff they're doing, but unfortunately, it's uh, not, many, not many people use it. Uh, but I keep my eyes on these. Uh, Cortana sort of went the way of the dinosaur. Not so much. It has, she hasn't gone away, uh, but she's less of a voice assistant now and more of the next generation Clippy. And so she's not quite doing as much as she used to. So I, I don't do a lot with Cortana these days. Uh, and Siri, like I said, bless her heart. Just dumb as a rock. Um, no, that's not what I meant to say. No, the developer experience for Siri is just, in my opinion, not that great. Right now, you still you have to develop an iOS app, essentially, for Siri. You have to have your Siri devices, your smart speakers, tethered to your phone or to a, some other device for them to work. And I, I just don't think that's going to, it's not what I want to do. The only thing that I thought was interesting is a couple years ago, and I heard this. I read this, and they were, in all seriousness, they were saying that Apple was rumored to be releasing a Siri OS. The idea being that you would be developing for Siri, not developing for iOS. You would be focused on Siri and developing for Siri devices, so you wouldn't have to necessarily tether. That was their, where they were headed with this. And I was, I was like, well, I'm excited about that. I'd like to see how that turns out. You know what it was called? Siri us, Siri, I'm not making this stuff up. I really read that. But then COVID happened or something. I don't know exactly something for some reason. Nobody's talked about it since then. 
it was, it was all the buzz right before COVID and then it just disappeared. Bixby was supposed to have a home speaker too. Uh, Samsung was gonna have a home smart speaker too and that sort of disappeared around the same time. It was all, all sorts of bad things happened uh, about two years ago. But then there's these other things that are interesting too, just for fun. Uh, I won't go into those, just if you don't have Xfinity, you don't know what I'm, you don't know what I'm talking about, but you can talk to your TV if you do. Um, Vector, I, I love my little Vector robot, he's fine, you can talk to that. But the thing I'm gonna focus on in this session is Alexa, because I just, I don't even have enough time to cover Alexa. I definitely don't have enough time to cover Alexa and Google Assistant in a single session. So, this is where we're gonna focus. But what can Alexa do? Alexa can do, obviously, simple question and answers. That's obvious. I mean, you can ask, in fact, I did today because I was actually curious. I asked when, uh, what was I asking today? I was asking something about a date. I can't remember what it was. I just simply said, Alexa, when is such and such? And she told me, and that was helpful. And you can do, there's actually a website that's like Alexa Answers. You can go answer questions. So if, if anybody ever asks Alexa a question that she doesn't know the answer to, that gets sort of logged somewhere. You can go out to this website and you can answer those questions. So that the next time somebody asks that, those, it's kind of like their version of Wikipedia. You, you, your answer can be the one that Alexa gives if you're interested in doing that. You can also set up your own Q&A skills. There's these templated skills that you can create where you can provide Q&A skills primarily for your, your own use inside your own house. So if you like have guests coming over and you want them to be able to connect to your Wi-Fi, you can say, you can have them say, Alexa, what's the Wi-Fi password? And she will tell them. Of course, you don't want to publish that outside of your house, but inside your house, you can do that. You can do smart home controls. That's what most people think about when they think about, about these voice assistants. They think about turning on your oven or turning on your lights, and that's a great feature. I love that. I, 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 it's a sucker's game to get up and preheat your oven now, okay? Uh, I love the fact, I've, I've got a new house. I, I moved into a brand new house, was built. Uh, just almost three years ago, and I had no idea they were putting this oven in. I mean, I should have known, but somehow I missed it. It has Alexa support. I can ask Alexa to preheat my oven. It's so cool. That's a sucker's game to get up and preheat the oven, because then you sit down and wait for it, and you have to get up again to put the stuff in, right? No, it's great to be able to do that. You can do music and video skills. Now, obviously, Alexa can play music but you can create your own custom music, your own custom radio station skills if you want, custom video skills for devices that have screens. You can do those things. I don't do any of those things. These are interesting, but I don't cover these. What I'm interested in, are, uh, to a, a small degree, is games and interactive fiction. There's some really cool games out there. And there is a, a project that I'm not covering tonight, but there is a project out there called Alexa Skill Flow Builder. It allows you to build interactive fiction. Sort of think of it as Zork for Alexa. You can build those kinds of things. And there's also another project that goes with it called Litexa. Or it doesn't go with it, it's, it's by the same team. Litexa seems to scratch the same itch as Skill Flow Builder and is newer. So I'm kind of getting the feeling one's going to replace the other. But just so you know, you're aware of them, there's Skill Flow Builder and Litexa you might want to check into for interactive fiction. But the, the real interesting thing is when you're using Alexa as a user interface, front end to some back end API. Now, you can just stop here too. You can build a UI front end. In fact, most of what I'm gonna do tonight is exactly that. I'm not gonna build anything that talks to any sort of back end system. Just not gonna have time to mess with that tonight. But what it comes down to is, you build this, and when you're ready to talk to the back end, you pick whatever HTTP client you like to use, and you make a call to that. That's it. And so I have a few examples I can show you of, of things I've built that do that kind of thing, but I'm not gonna show you all the details of how to build it, because that gets way outside the time we have to do that. But I do have, if you're interested in it, I have a video toward the end of the, like in the last slide, I have a link to some videos, and one of them covers how, exactly how to do that. With a spring back end, no less. Cool. So where is Alexa? Smart speakers, obviously, everybody knows about those. Here's one right here. I have an Echo Dot here 
uh, third generation Echo Dot here on the table. Uh, smart screens and hubs. A lot of people don't realize this, but Alexa has, or uh, Amazon has, uh, these things called Echo Shows. And in Echo Show, there's four, five, six different varieties of them right now. Uh, I have three in my house. Uh, there's the Echo Show 5 is about that big. No, the 5 is about that big. It's like a little, it's about the size of an alarm clock. I have an Echo Show 8 at my desk. I have an Echo Show, the second generation one, which is like this big, in our living area. And then I recently got, I'm so proud of this, it's so cool, an Echo Show 15, which is a 15-inch display hanging on the wall. And the coolest thing about the Echo Show 15 is that it recognizes my face so when I walk up to it, it knows it's me and it shows me my, my information, like my calendar entries and my to-do list. If I talk to it, it shows me my, it knows it's me and talk, shows me my stuff. Um, and there's also the Echo Show 15 is the only one that has these things called widgets that can stay on the screen all the time. So you can create Alexa skills that provide widgets and those are, stay up there all the time. Unfortunately, the widget developer program is still by invitation only, and I have not received my invitation yet. So I can't talk about much how to do that because I've never done it. But I have ideas that I want to, to, do, to do that, and it'll be really awesome. There's also, I don't own one of these, but Echo Show 10 is a smaller device. It it's, sits on this, it's a screen, but it sits on this little thing that rotates. It will follow you around the room. So if you're talking to it and you move, it'll turn to watch you. So you, basically the idea is, if, example is you're working a recipe and you're using Alexa, you're using the Echo Show 10 as your, your recipe device and you're moving around the kitchen cutting this up or putting this in the pan or whatever, when you turn and look at it, it's always facing you, which is kind of cool. I don't own one of those, but they're really cool. Fire TV, if you have a Fire TV, Fire Stick, you can talk to Alexa. And it gives you the same, same, more or less the same experience as if you're talking to one of those smart screens. Cars, more cars now have Alexa built in. And if you don't have a car with Alexa built in, like my 1993 Ford Bronco does not have Alexa built in. I know you're shocked. But my Bronco does not have Alexa built in. You can get Echo Auto, which essentially just links to your phone and uses your phone's internet connection and your phone's stuff, but it pipes it through the speakers in the car, so you don't have to turn your phone on to talk to Alexa. You can just talk to this thing, it'll talk to your phone, and your phone will play it through the speakers. And it's a relatively inexpensive device for what it does. Uh, smartphones. I mean, there is not an Alexa phone, but if you, if you have an Android device or, you, or, you, or an Android phone or an iPhone, you can install the Alexa, um, the Alexa, what's it called, the companion application. And on that, you can talk to Alexa through that. Wearables, now, I love talking about wearables, and here's why. Guess what this is on my finger? I can talk to Alexa. <laughs> now, I don't, when I say Alexa to it, it doesn't do anything. There's a little button back here I can hit with my thumb. I can ask a question and hold it up to my ear and I can hear it. I would demonstrate it to you, but you'd all have to come up here and listen to it, because it's not very loud. Where's my phone. Also, where's it at? Where did I put it? Probably messing with the uh, mic right now. But yeah, right here in my pocket. You know what these are? These are Echo Buds, like ear, air buds, but I can talk to Alexa on those. Isn't that cool? Um, and I don't have it yet, but I'm looking forward to getting it. There's a device that's coming out this month or next month is what I'm hearing the shipping data on it is. It's, a, it's a bit, essentially a pop socket you put on the back of your phone, but instead of the the circle being a picture of something, it's actually a microphone. It looks kind of like a tiny little echo dot. And the idea behind it is you, can, you don't have to open your phone to talk to Alexa, you can just talk to Alexa. It'll, that thing will listen and use the phone's app to do its work, but it'll let you talk to it. And what's also supposedly cool about it is you can also talk to Google Assistant on it using the same thing. So I ordered me one of those. I'm looking, it's called TalkSocket if anybody wants to go check that out. So yeah, wearables, also echo frames. I don't have those, but if you wear glasses, you can get frames where that you can talk to Alexa on and they play through your ear back here or something, I don't know. I hear people, I've heard of people who had them and they say they like them, but I don't know much about them because I don't wear glasses. But. So 
the idea is Alexa is everywhere, which I think is on the back of my jacket. It says that somewhere. Um, but Alexa everywhere. And the reason this is cool is because I want to be able to have that experience that they had on the enterprise where you could talk to the computer no matter where you're at and get the answers or fire up the, the, the oven or whatever you need to do wherever you're at. And I have done exactly that. I have used this at the store to preheat my oven so that when I got home, I could pop that pizza in. I didn't have to wait when I got home. I could just start preheating the oven while I'm at the store buying the pizza. And I like the idea of being able to talk to applications. And I'm going to show you, before we get too deep in the coding part, I'm going to show you one example app I have that I actually wrote specifically for on-the-go devices. This was the device I had in mind, but it'll go with any device. I want to show you that, that app. It's really cool. I'm not going to invite you up here to listen to it. I'll, I'll play it on this thing, but you'll get the idea. So before we get into the code, I have to talk about some of the, the concepts of the anatomy of building an Alexa skill. First off, a skill, it's an app for Alexa. We already talked about that. There's the invocation name. This is how your skill is started. So if you think about like a desktop application, you have an icon on the screen. You double click the, the, the icon, the app opens up, right? If you have a web app, you, you have a, a, a URL or you have a link on some page or somewhere that you click on and the app opens in your browser. An invocation name is the same idea, but for voice. It's like a voice icon. So if your application's name is, um, I'll pick on the one I'm going to show you, Mouse Guess, then you say, Alexa, open Mouse Guess. Or if you want to do a deep link and go ahead and just ask the question up front, you can say, Alexa, ask Mouse Guess, what time does Epcot open tomorrow? and it goes straight into it. Otherwise, you say, Alexa, open mouse guest, and once it opens, you say, what time does Epcot open tomorrow? Things like that. It's how you launch your skill. And utterance are things a human might say. And you think about it, we have four people, five people, six people in the room, well, five people, I can't count, I'm, I'm really, you know, six people in the room, in the room, several people at home, and if we were to ask everybody we were to write on a piece of paper a task you wanted Alexa to do, and we wanted you to put in your own words how you would ask her to do that. Just with the six people in the room, we would probably have a dozen different ways of doing it, right? Because people say things differently. Just the sentence I just said, I could have probably re reworded a couple of different ways without even trying. Because people will say this different things, different ways, depending on whatever words strike them when they decide to say something. You don't want to make a, a voice interface where the user has to say a specific string of words to make it work. That's horrible. Humans are going to say whatever they want to say and hope it works. And so utterances are all the things a human might say. And you can dream up as many of these as you want. It's a good idea to dream up lots of them. And if you're developing an, a, a, an Alexa skill where the user is a child, if you're developing like an educational or a game skill where the target audience are children, you're in trouble because they are going to say crazy stuff. I mean, the six of us here could probably think of a dozen things. A child will say the craziest stuff. And adults are more forgiving because we don't expect it to work. So we're going to talk to Alexa in a very stilted, robotic way because we think that's what she wants. If she doesn't, she'll work with that. But we're going to talk to it in a very stilted way to make it work because that's how it, we, we didn't grow up that way. Children expect her to answer. The children are going to say whatever they want to say, and they expect her to do what, she, th th what they ask. And if, if, they, if Alexa doesn't do what the child asks, the child's going to say, this is stupid, and walk off. So you, when you're developing skills, you have to think about how your users are going to say things. And those get mapped, those get ultimately turned into utterances that a user might say. Intents are the more specific thing. Utterances get turned into intents. Intents are very precise. So I might say, order a pizza. Or I might say, uh, get me a pizza. Or I might say, I want to eat pizza tonight. Those are three different ways I could order a pizza. And we could probably think dozens of other ways if we tried hard enough. But at the end of the day, what am I doing? I'm ordering a pizza. And so I would have an intent. Perhaps I could name it whatever I want. But I, I could name it, perhaps, order pizza intent. 
And that is the very specific thing we're trying to do, no matter how we set it. And so utterances get mapped into those intents. Slots are parameters. So I, did, I said order a pizza. Now, Alexa may come along in that case and ask follow-up questions to get clarification on what kind of pizza I want. I could just simply say, order a pepperoni pizza, where the pepperoni is a, is a value I've given to a slot. It's a parameter I'm passing into that utterance and ultimately into the intent handler. There's also support for multi-value slots, which are kind of cool. I probably won't cover them tonight, but they're really cool. The idea is you could ask Alexa to order a pizza, and she might say, what do you want on your pizza? And you say, pepperoni. What else do you want on your pizza? Green pepper. What else do you want on your pizza? Olives. What else do you want on your pizza? See, this gets really old. Multi-value slots are simpler. You say, order a pizza. Alexa says, what do you want on your pizza? I want pepperoni, green peppers, and olives. And she takes all of those as three values to the same slot. And those are relatively new. They've only been around for a couple of years, multi-value slots. But they, they make it easier and more natural to talk to her. Fulfillment. This is how you write. This is the code you write. This is where you really get to write some code. And how you write your code is up to you. I mean, you can make it do whatever you want. There's, there's a framework that you have to follow. But once you get into that framework and you're implementing these methods, you can make them do whatever you want them to do, anything. If you can write the code to do it, you can make Alexa do it, which means you can call out the back-end systems. You can hit a database. You can pick up something from a, an S3 bucket. You can any number of things. You can call out to a REST API. Lots of things you can do here. And how you develop it, what language you develop it in, that's also kind of up to you, but I have some recommendations. I'm a Java developer. This is what I do and have done as my job for all but a very short stint about 10 years ago, about 12 years ago when I did C-sharp for a very small project. But I've been paid to do Java for almost my entire career. And I love Java. Love it. It's great. And you can develop Alexa skills in Java. Don't. Just don't. Because a number of reasons, but the, the very basic reason is there's, the development story with Java is just not that great. It's, there's not as many, uh, there's not as much support, there's not as many resources for it, there's not, there's a lot of things you just can't get. You also could do it in Python. And I have no strong feelings one way or the other toward Python. I'm not a very strong Python developer. Um, I've done a little bit here and there, but I just don't feel confident in it. I know people who develop Alexa skills using Python, and they love it. And Python's a great choice if you're into Python. And there is a lot more resources for Python than there is for Java. But I don't do that. The path of least resistance is JavaScript, by far. There is so much support for developing Alexa skills in JavaScript. There's, there's tooling. There's, there's uh, documentation. There's testing stuff. There's all sorts of things. And I prefer working in JavaScript when I do that, just because of all the, uh, the ecosystem just leads me that way. But I hear good things about Python. I'm not going to say a bad thing about it. Java, just don't. Just don't. Sorry. Just don't. That's going to be a, a source of frustration for you. I tried to make myself do that early on. It's a source of frustration. Just don't. Just go ahead, write JavaScript. All right. Uh, yes. Do I use Node? Yes. It's, ultimately, it's Node. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so you write that, how you write your fulfillment code. Um, cards, we're not going to, I'll show you a little bit about cards perhaps. Uh, they're fairly easy to add, not a big deal. But I talked about this, this companion application that's on your phone. It's also available by a website. And whenever you speak to Alexa, a skill could write a card. And what a card does is it's really basic. There's not a lot you can do with them, but it's sort of a record of what just happened. And it puts it into the for the uh, companion application. So you can go see the, see the activity that you did with that. Some sites use it to maybe show you a picture of something or to give you a little bit of extra information that Alexa didn't say out loud. But you can all, most people don't even know cards exist. The main use of cards that most people use, for, use it for is what's called, um, let me think about it for a minute. It's called account linking. So if you have a back-end system and you, wanna, you need to authenticate into the back-end system and get a token so that you can talk to the back-end API, usually that's an OAuth2 type 
story that we're telling here. Account linking will give you a card on your Alexa companion application. They'll give you a link so you can go basically do the whole OAuth 2 dance on your phone or on your, on your browser to authorize the Alexa skill to talk to the back end app, and then you go back and talk to Alexa again. That said, there is some new stuff. I haven't got a chance to try it yet, but there is some new stuff where you can actually do a lot of account linking just with your voice now. I haven't tried it yet. It's interesting. Um, there's APL. I'm going to show you a minimal amount of APL tonight, just because I, I could do an entire session on nothing but APL and still not have enough time. But APL is the Alexa presentation language. It allows, it's a, it's, think of it as HTML for Alexa, but it's not HTML, it's JSON. But it has style sheets that you can ass assign to things, it has components, you can create these really rich environments, and these are for devices like Echo Shows or Fire TVs that have screens on them. In fact, here's the coolest thing, I, did, I should have mentioned this earlier when I was talking about wearables. I have an Apple Watch. Now when I talk to my Apple Watch, I'm talking to Siri. I mean, you already heard my opinion about Siri, right? But there's an app you can get for your Apple Watch called Voice in a Can. And I've spent, you don't know how many hours interacting with the developer for Voice in a Can because I've been helping him fix some interesting problems that he encountered. But what's, what's cool about Voice in a Can is if you have an Apple Watch and you're talking to Voice in a Can and you're using APL, it shows up there. The, the APL shows up on your watch. It's so cool. Now, that said, the, the application, the skill that I created, and I was tr trying to get it to work on the watch, I didn't optimize my APL for a square screen. It was more for a landscape screen, so it looks a little weird on there. I need to do some work to fix that. Uh, but it still works, and that, that blew my mind when I could see it on there. It's so cool. Um, APLA is the same as APL. It, it's very, once you know APL, or once you know APLA, you know, you, you, it's easy to pick up the other because the structure is very similar. The difference is this creates visual output, this creates audio output. It allows you to do things like mixing sound and voice in ways that you can't do just with a standard response. Now you don't have to use APLA. APLA is completely an optional choice. You can just simply return strings and she will say whatever you return. You can return something I'm going to talk about on the next slide called SSML and she will speak it however the SSML tells it to say. There's only so much you can do with just plain strings and SSML. APLA lets you do all sorts of interesting things like play audio and, and voice on top of each other, like having a background sound while she's speaking and mixing it and turning the volume up and down. There's some cool things you can do there. But here's some other things you should get to know. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but I will try to get to a dialogues tonight. It's a way, think of it as a wizard. It's a way of Alexa asking qu follow-up questions. So, so when I said, I want to order a pizza, she might say, okay, I don't know what toppings you want, so let me ask you, what do you want on that? And a dialogue would help you do that. Conversations are just like dialogues, but they're smarter. They're AI-driven. I definitely, I do a whole session on this and can't even get those done in the time I have because dialogues use a kind of a machine learning training that they have to go through even the simplest dialogue takes about 20 minutes to build because it's doing that, that, that machine learning training uh, to train a model. But once you're done, they're really cool. Dialogues are, are Alexa leading the user by the nose to get the answers she wants. Conversations act like that, but the user can say whatever they want. They can even change their mind about something they've told Alexa before, and they can even go on tangents. Like you might say, a conversation for like a travel application might say, Alexa might say, where do you want to go? And the user will say, I want to go to Chicago. When do you want to leave? And the user might say, no, make that Miami. And she will understand that they changed their mind. And then she'll say, okay, Miami, now when do you want to leave? Wait a minute, what's the weather like in Miami at this time of the year? Which is completely has nothing to do with planning travel, except for the user wants to know that. And so it can actually leave the, basically leave the conversation to answer a question and then come back into the conversation. You can't do that with dialogues. Dialogues are leading the user by the nose. If the user said, I want to go to Chicago, and then Alexa said, when do you want to leave? And the user said, I want to go, no, make that Miami. The user is going to not understand what that means because she's expecting a date at that point. So dialogues are cool. Conversations are awesome. I have a lot of complaints about conversations, 
they're still in beta for one, th well, there's two versions of conversations. One of them's in beta and it's the good one. <laughs> and the, the one that's not in beta sucks. Um, so we won't talk about that. But conversations are awesome once you, once you uh, get, get into those, but that's a definitely a more advanced topic. In skill purchases, you can make money from your skills. And people do. And you think, well, sure, people are making spending money, you know, not that big a deal, right? Look up, when you get a chance, look up a, a man by the name of Nick Schwab. Nick Schwab created what has got to be the most obvious Alexa skill ever, aside from Hello World. It's the most obvious Alexa skill ever. It's ambient background noise, sleep sounds. So you could say, Alexa, play thunderstorm sounds. And if you say, if you ask your Alexa device to play thunderstorm sounds, chances are it's going to be one of Nick Schwab's skills that's doing that. And it's free. You can use thunderstorm sounds. You can use Nick Schwab's, what he calls sleep, the name of the overall category of skills he has are called Sleep Jar. That's his company or his brand name is Sleep Jar. And he has several different sounds that you can use. But for 99 cents a month, you can get premium sounds. And guess what? People do. It's the most obvious thing to build ever. And it's easy to build, right? I mean, gathering the sounds is far more difficult than actually writing the code that plays them, by far. And yet Nick Schwab created this set of skills that plays ambient background sounds, charges 99 cents for the premium sounds, and Nick Schwab, and this is like in a 2019 article, so it's been a few years, Nick Schwab made enough money doing that that he left his job doing other stuff. He left his job, started a company that does, that's focused on building Alexa skills, bought himself a Tesla, and here just this last year, he traded in that Tesla and has a newer Tesla. And then about a month ago, he got rid of the Tesla because the Tesla tried to like throw it on the brakes for no good reason in the middle of traffic and he almost died. Uh, so he basically told Tesla, please take my car back. I don't want it anymore. But still, he was able to buy the Tesla and send it back. That's how much money he made writing Alexa skills. And there's other people who are making money doing Alexa skills that same way. It's really cool. SSML, it's a way to embellish how Alexa speaks. I'll show you a little demo of that later. We won't spend a lot of time on it, but it's, it's really fun. Uh, I could easily waste hours playing with SSML because it's fun. Account linking, I talked about how you can access backend APIs and essentially it's, it's authorization for Alexa to access those APIs. So it's essentially OAuth 2. And then this is kind of cool. I've actually been playing with this a little bit lately in my spare time. Voice, face, and pen identity. Alexa can know who you are based on your, your face. So if you have an Echo Show 10 or an Echo Show 15, those are the only devices that support it right now. But if the camera is on, she will know who you are by your face. If you speak, she can know who you are by your voice pattern. If you, and each, each one of those has a, a certainty number associated with it. And so the higher the certainty, the more certain she feels that that is in fact who you are based on your voice or your face. You can raise that certainty really high by assigning the user a pin so that when she sees you or she hears you and you provide a pin, she'll say, yep, that's you. Because how on earth would it be somebody who looks and sounds like you and knows your pin, unless it's like your twin brother? I mean, other than that, I mean, there, she's going to pick it out. And it's really, she's really good at the voice. When I played around with this, I, I, she knows my voice, and I've tried to talk to her by changing my voice, speaking with a lower voice, speaking with a high voice, and she still knew it was me. But if my daughter comes in and talks to it, it knows it's her. It's really pretty cool. And uh, I'm not going to cover that tonight, but just know you can do that. It's really awesome. So here's a general Alexa request flow. User says this. These are slots. How big was the dinosaur? How large was the dinosaur? What size was the dinosaur? It goes to the dinosaur size intent, which goes to some code that handles it. JavaScript, Python, Java, if you want to. Theoretically, it could literally be any language you want. It doesn't have to even be those three I mentioned. It could be any language you want, as long as you're willing to put it on S3. I'm sorry, not S3, I just misspoke. AWS Lambda, or you want to host it yourself. And if you host it yourself, it has to be able to handle post requests. That's it. So you can pick whatever you want. 
Now, that said, I'm not going to show you how to do any of that. I'm going to show you how to do JavaScript code, node running on AWS Lambda, but not my Lambda account. I'm going to show you something else that's really nice and free. Here's what you need, though. You need a computer. Everybody here have a computer? You're going to need a web browser. I assume everybody has a web browser. You're going to need a Git client. Most of you probably have one, I'm guessing. If not, maybe you're still using CVS or Subversion or something like that. But a Git client is going to be helpful for you. You're going to need an editor. You pick your favorite text editor, the one you feel comfortable using when you're writing JavaScript or Python code. I prefer VS Code, and you'll see why in a moment. But you can use anything. You're going to need Node and NPM, or you're going to need Python or Java. But again, I'm going to stick with Node. You're going to need an Alexa developer account. So if you go to developer.amazon.com, you're going to have to sign up for an Amazon developer account. That is not the same thing as an AWS developer account. Those are two different things. But you're going to need at least that much. And then optionally, you can get an AWS developer account. But you don't need this one if you're only going to use what they call Alexa hosted skills. You don't need the AWS developer. If you want to host it in AWS Lambda yourself under your AWS Lambda account, then you're going to need an AWS developer account. You, you don't have to. You can use Alexa hosted skills and just use an Alexa developer account. I'm doing horribly on time. Cool. Um, and what you don't need is an Alexa enabled device. I mean, if you have one, it certainly will help. No question about it. It's a lot more fun testing it with a real device than it is testing it with some of the other tools. But you don't need it. My very first Alexa skill, I did not even own an Alexa device anywhere of any kind. Not even a Fire Stick. I didn't own anything that I could talk to Alexa on. You don't need it. You're going to want one. In fact, if you're like me, now you want them all. I mean, I have three of my, just on my person right now. So, um, and, that, and never mind at my desk, I have several. You're going to want them all, so be careful with that. It could, it could get expensive. OK, just warning you about that. All right, so let's go ahead and write some code. I'm going to sit down now and show you how this works. And I'll zoom in and out as necessary. Uh, I'm going to move this out of the way. And I've already got a directory here that I've created called dosug. I'll make that font a little bit bigger for you. And you'll see there's nothing in here. Now, I'm going to tell you what I did before I got here. You're going to have to do this yourself, but you're going to want to install the ASK CLI, or the Alexa Skills Kit command line interface. I love the name, ASK, because it also is kind of what you're going to do. You're going to ask it questions, right? The Alexa Skills Kit. And the way you install that, I'm not going to do it because I don't need to, but it's npm install dash g ASK CLI, and that will install it for you. If I did it now, it'd try to update it, which would probably be fine, but I don't want to risk it right now before I start doing anything else. So I'm not going to do that. But once you have it installed, then you're going to do this thing called ask, oops, you're going to say ask configure, which I'm also not going to do. But what ask configure is going to do is it's going to ask you to log into your Amazon developer account, and then if you're using AWS, to log in as an AWS developer, so that the ASK CLI will know how to talk to those things. So you're going to want to do ask configure as your next move. And then you're ready to roll. Again, I have nothing in this directory. I created this directory before I left today. Nothing in there. What you're going to do is you're going to say ask new. We're going to create a new project. If you've developed with Spring Boot before, this is kind of like the Spring Boot initializer or start.spring.io. It's the same kind of idea. Uh, but instead of doing it in a web browser or in your IDE, I'm doing it here. I'm going to say ask new, and it's going to ask me some questions. I get to choose between Node, Python, or Java. Well, guess what I'm going to use? I'm going to use Node. I get to choose either Alexa hosted skills. Let me make this a little bit bigger because I hate the wrapping on there. Alexa hosted skills, cloud formation, Lambda, or ho self-hosted. Now, I'm going to pick Alexa hosted skills. As it says, it's free. But also, so is AWS Lambda, to a point. Uh, I have not spent a dime developing skills. Not a single dime has been given to Amazon for the purpose of de skill development. I've paid them for hosting you know, you know, my S3 account where I drop all my photos and stuff like that in there, or for my, my, my website 
hosting. I've paid them a little bit, but not much. Uh, but for Alexa skills, I haven't paid them a single dime. And some, and a lot of those are Lambda hosted because I created those before AWS or for, before Alexa hosted skills came along. The nice thing about working with Alexa hosted skills is it does a lot of the junk for you. There's a lot of stuff you just don't have to do. You just say, give me an Alexa hosted skill and it takes care of everything else for you. Among those everything else things it does is it will create an AWS Lambda deployment for you. But it's not in your Lambda space. It's something that Alexa is offering. Amazon's basically paying, paying the bill for that. And it's going into their space. It gives you an S3 bucket. So if you want to host any images or sound files, it'll create an S3 bucket for you. It'll create a DynamoDB database for you, and you can use that. Now, that said, there are some limitations with Alexa hosted skills. Don't ask me what they are because I haven't bumped up against them, but every so often I hear about people who have. And one of the limitations I do know of is once your skill gets popular enough that it's got a lot of traffic, Amazon's going to reach out to you and say, hey, you want to move that over to AWS Lambda so we can start charging you for it? Um, because, I mean, they don't want to, you to get away with it for free forever. Um, but as long as you're not, as long as your skill's not super popular, it's free. And it will be forever. You don't have to worry about paying a dime. So I'm going to pick, AW, I'm going to pick Alexa hosted skills. AWS Lambda is what I used to choose. And at the end of the day, developing for either one of those is almost identical experience. Really, there's very subtle differences, and that's it. And the most noticeable difference is the way you deploy a skill. With Alexa hosted skills, it's going to give you a, um, it's going to give you a Git repository. And so the way you deploy is you just do a Git push. And they have a code commit repository. They have a, a build that's going to pick, see that commit, pick it up, and deploy it for you. Where if you're using AWS Lambda hosted, you have to find your, you have to go set up your own Git, re, Git repository wherever you want to put it. If you want to do any sort of CI, you have to go set that up yourself. And if you don't want to do CI, that's fine. You, then you use the ASK CLI. You say ask deploy to deploy it. But with Alexa hosted skills, it's just Git commits. It's a piece of cake. You have your choice of your region, because again, even though I'm not using AWS Lambda hosting, it's still going into Lambda, so I have to pick a region I want to put it in. What's the correct answer? It's always US East 1, right? Oh, always. I mean, you can pick whatever you want, but that's what everybody picks, right? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm fine with that for today's purposes. We could reason through why I should maybe pick something else, but I'm just going to go ahead and stick with that. Um, and then you give your skill a name. I'm going to call this Hello Denver. That's a, it's going to be a big, long name, isn't it? Open, I'm just going to say, it, hello, Denver, open source. That's what we'll call it, not the whole name, because otherwise I don't, want, I don't want a big, long name. And then it's going to say, OK, what directory you want to put this in? It's going to base it on that name, so I'm going to stick with that name. And we're good. It's going to take about a minute. And what it's doing right now is it's setting up that S3 bucket, setting up that DynamoDB, setting up that that code commit repository, setting up the CI, setting up the Lambda. It's actually going to deploy it at some point. It's going to build the interaction models. It's going to do all this stuff. So it takes about a minute to get all these things in place. But once it's done, I'll be ready to roll. Now that said, while I'm waiting on that, I want to demo this other skill, just so you see what it's doing. So I'm going to say, Alexa, ask mouse guests, what time does Epcot open tomorrow? March 2nd, 2022, Epcot opens at 8.30 a.m. and closes at 9 p.m. Okay, I that's a skill I created so that when you're in going to Disneyland or Disneyland, you can ask questions about the parks. For example, and, and it was created for this because I'm not going to carry this around me, with me when I'm walking around in Disney World, right? That's stupid. But I could do it with this. I can say, Alexa, ask Mouse Guess. Well, she went to sleep for some reason. Alexa. Ask, Ask Mouse Guess, what's, what's the, wait the wait time, time for, for Pirates, Pirates of the Caribbean? Of the, Caribbean? the wait time for Pirates of the Caribbean in Disney World's Magic Kingdom is 10 minutes. The wait time for Pirates of the Caribbean in Disneyland is 45 minutes. That's insane, 45 minutes. More. Alexa, Ask Mouse Guess, what is the wait time for Rise of the Resistance? For Star Wars. Rise of the Resistance in Disney's Hollywood Studios is 75 minutes. That's about right. Star Wars, 
Miles of the Resistance in Disneyland is currently down. That's live data. I mean, you, if you have the Disneyland or Disney World app on your phone, you can check and verify that that's accurate. And so I'm not going to carry this around with me when I'm in ask those questions, but I can do it on this, or I can do it with the talk socket that I'm hoping to get, or I could do it on my watch, or I could do it on my phone. That's, I, I created that skill for this, and that is using a back-end API, not my API. It's another uh, third-party API that I'm taking advantage of that knows those answers. Um, but that's, that, I'm, I think that's the coolest skill I could ever create, honestly. I don't know. Maybe it's just me because I go to Disney all the time, but still, it's the coolest thing ever. All right. With that said, it looks like this is done. And let's give it a shot. Let's open it up. So let's go into Hello Denver Open Source, and let's open it up in VS Code. Now, the reason I choose VS Code is because VS Code, there's an extension you can add to VS Code called the Alexa Skills Toolkit. And you're definitely going to want to get that. Now, you don't have to, but it's, it's so awesome if you want to use it. All right, so here we go. Let's take a quick tour. I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to use any of the Alexa Skills Toolkit stuff right now, but I'll show you in a minute how you could do something else with it. And so I'm going to close that and get rid of it. I'm going to open up Skill Package. Now, Skill Package is where your deployment manifest is. That's in skill.json. And generally, you don't want to worry yourself too much with this file at first. This file comes in later when you're ready to actually publish it. So that gives me an opportunity to tell you the difference between deploying and publishing. Deploying means I'm deploying it, I can test it. Any of the devices that I have in my house that are connected to my account can use it, but nobody in the world, else, nobody else outside of the, my house can use it. Nobody else who doesn't have a device connected to my account can use it. So that's for my, you can create all the skills you want all day long for your own personal use, and you don't have to answer anybody's questions, you don't have to go through any sort of certification, you can just go nuts with it. Knock yourself out. As soon as you want to share it with anybody outside of your house, you have two choices. You can beta test it, but even that's only for a period of time. You can set it up a, you know, for the next month. Here's a list of people who are allowed to use it. You can do that. But it, again, that's limited for only a period of time. Or you can publish it. Publishing it means make it available out to the outside world. And when you make it available to the outside world, when you publish it, you also can, can pick which uh, locales and languages you want to support. So I might publish it only for the US and not for anyone else. Or I might only publish it because I don't want to deal with the translation aspects that are involved. I might only publish it to English speaking countries. Or I could publish it to everybody. Or it may not even make sense to publish it to everybody. I mean, certain skills, I mean, if you're developing for, um, for a local restaurant that's only in your town, it makes little sense for you to publish it to India. I mean, really, it doesn't. So uh, maybe that's why you don't publish it to everybody. Regardless, if you do choose to create a multi-language, multi-locale skill, let me give you this tip. Please do. I mean, if it makes sense to publish it, please do it. But don't do it on day one. Trust me on this. Because now you have to maintain multiple interaction models. Get your skill published in English or whatever your chosen, first chosen language is. Get it published there first then translate it because otherwise you're going to you have a lot more maintenance you have to do there are some tools that help you do what's called interaction model cloning at the end of the day it's, it's not much different than just copying a json file <laughs> and so uh it's just it's and you still have to maintain multiple copies so do do one first and then branch out don't try to do them all on day one that's a horrible idea all right so ignore the the you don't have to worry about the skill deployment manifest Leave it alone. This only comes into play later on when you're ready to publish and you're going to add some additional information to it. So I'm going to go ahead and close that. Don't really need that either. Under interaction models, we have ENUS. So by default, you're going to get ENUS. And then you can add whatever interaction model you want, or you can even change it. If you don't want to use English US, you can change it. I only recently realized, after working with Alexa for years, I only recently realized if I wanted to support all of English in one, it's just EN. I can create an en.json and it'll support all of the English ones, um, which was really weird. I didn't realize that. But um, regardless, I got English US. And the first thing you're going to see here at the top, you zoom in a little bit more just because I want to make sure everybody can read that, although it means it's going to be harder for me to scroll around. Maybe I scroll back one. There we go. 
we have an invocation name. This is the, the thing I mentioned on the slide. This is the vocal icon that's going to launch this thing. And it's change me. I need to change it. So please do what it says when it says change me. Uh, so I'm going to change it to Denver. Um, actually, tell you what I'm going to do. I'll make it all lowercase for reasons that are uh, I'll talk about in a second. But Denver open source, OK, is what we'll call it. So there are some rules around your invocation name. One of the rules is you can't use numerals in it. You can't put like the letter or the numeral eight in there. If you want to say eight, you have to spell out eight. You also has to have at least two words. Unless your company has, is a single named, a single worded company and you want to use that name, in which case you need to have proof that you have the right to use that name, which is true even if it's two or three words, you still have to have that proof. Uh, Amazon is not going to allow you to use that name. You, you can use it deployed all day long, but when you're ready to publish, they're going to reject it during certification if you're using a trademarked or um, you know, a, a company name. Uh, and they're going to reject it if it's not at least two words, unless you can prove and work with them and prove that you actually have the right to use the single worded name. Um, there's other rules that I can't remember right now, but um, we'll just go with that. There's a lot of other ru uh, rules that you're going to have to deal with. But the one rule that doesn't exist is it doesn't have to be unique. There could be a hundred other Denver open source skills out there right now. And then how do you know that the user is hitting the right one? And the answer to that is you really don't. So it is a good idea to have it unique, but it's not required that it be unique. This is also a source of frustration. I'm going to tell you how you're going to probably be just as frustrated as I was when I first did this. I created a Hello World skill. And guess what I called it? I called it Hello World because I wasn't very clever. Guess how many other Hello World skills are out there that are actually published? Not just deployed, but published. Lots of them. And so here's what I did. I created a Hello World skill, and I asked it to deploy. And what I didn't realize is my deployment failed for one reason or another. It doesn't really matter why, but my deployment failed. I thought it had been deployed. So I said, Alexa, open Hello World. And she opened somebody else's Hello World. And so the responses I was getting back were different than my Hello World. And I was frustrated. So I went and go ch to check out what was going on. I didn't know what was going on, so I tried to deploy it again. This time I noticed that it was broken. So I fixed the deployment and I deployed it again. So it deployed fine. And I said, Alexa, open Hello World. And it was still talking to somebody else's. Because what happens as soon as a user lands on a skill with a given invocation name, it sort of gets attached to their account. And that's the one they're going to go to forever now, unless they go explicitly go in and detach it from their account. And it's kind of frustrating. Um, there are things we could talk about. I just don't have time to go into on how you can sort of lead people to your skill. Um, one of them is called Quick Links. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but you can, essentially you can give somebody a link in an email or a tweet or something, and they can click on that. And what it'll do is it'll open up a web browser, and the web browser will basically ask them to verify that they want to do this. But as soon as they do, they hit a button, and then suddenly it'll start talking to their device. And that way, it, you know it's going to your skill and not somebody else's. With that, just happens to have the same name. But that's a whole marketing thing I don't want to get into. Uh, the idea of being, you know, making sure somebody gets to your skill and not somebody else's, and how they find your skills—that's a whole different topic. So I'm going to move on. And I'm going to talk about these intents. So we got several built-in intents. The, anytime you see an Amazon dot, that's a built-in intent. And so cancel, help, stop. There's another one down here called navigate home intent. Um, I'm going to leave it up to you to look up what most of these mean. I will talk a little bit about cancel intent and stop intent. Generally speaking, they're synonymous. They mean the same thing. However, there's a reason why there's two different intents and they're separate. Is because if you're in a, in, in a, just any old skill and somebody says cancel or they say stop, that's going to give an a stop or a cancel intent. And the skill can deal with that by leaving the skill. Just saying, okay, I'm done. See you later. Goodbye. Or if you're in a shopping intent, cancel may have special meaning. Cancel may mean cancel my order. Stop means get me out of the skill. On the other hand, you have a media skill, something that's playing some audio or some video, 
Well, stop means something there. Stop means stop playing the video. It doesn't mean I'm wanting to leave. I just stop playing that. Cancel means get me out of the skill. So that's why they have two separate intents that potentially could mean the same thing, but they don't have to. Help intent is for offering help. And notice that none of these have sample utterances on the, under them because Alexa already knows what the word cancel means or variations of the word cancel or, or synonyms for cancel. Alexa already knows what help is and all the synonyms for help, so you don't have to provide any more there. You can certainly ask, you can certainly add more there if you want to, if you can think of something that doesn't go to those intents that somebody might say, but uh, for the most part, you don't need to mess with those. But then we have hello world intent. Obviously, this can be a hello world skill, at least to start with. And these are the things a user might say. A user might say, hello, how are you? Say, hi world, all these things a user might say, but the user's not limited to these things. Because under the covers, we're still training a model. It's not as rich of a, of a machine learning model that we did with, that, or that we would do with conversations. It's not nearly as rich as that. But it's still clever enough that Alexa is going to be able to basically take anything that a user says that is close to these and assume that they mean hello world intent. Now, if the user doesn't, I don't see it in here because they didn't put it in there by default, there is also a fallback intent we could talk about. Not going to, don't have time. But a fallback intent is sort of your catch-all. That if a user doesn't say something that matches close enough, it'll go to the fallback intent. And then you can deal with that however you want. Hello world intent, because I don't have a fallback intent, if I said hello, well, it's going to go there. If I said hi, it's going to go there. If I said watermelon, it's going to go there. If I said puppies, it's going to go there because I don't have any other intents that are going to match those things. Because ultimately what's going to happen is when the user says something, it's going to create a score on how close it is to the thing that Alexa thinks she heard or thinks that you want to do. And the one with the highest score wins. The thing is, for lack of too many other intents, almost everything's going to match Hello World intent. Even if it's a super low score, it's still going to match. So having a fallback intent sort of raises that threshold a little bit so that not everything's going to match. And so it's a good idea to have a fallback intent. But we're, we're not going to add that tonight. Just don't have the time. And at the end of the day, adding a fallback intent is not that complicated. You add an entry like this, put Amazon.fallback intent, and then you write a handler for it and you're done. It's the same as any other intent in that, in that regard. The only thing that you, I can say about fallback intents is it has a default threshold, but you can also adjust that threshold. You can set it higher or lower so it's more sensitive or less sensitive. And there's some tools you can use to test to see before you even deploy this thing or even publish it, you can, there's some things you can do to test to say, okay, if, if the user says this, what's it going to go to? And you can, you can get some, uh, see what the expectations are there. But um, for now, just know that if the user says hello world, hello or how are you, it's going to go hello world intent. And then down here, we're at version one. Of this, inter of this interaction model. That version can be uh, bumped up as you evolve your skill, but for now, we're just gonna leave it as it is. We can also create custom types. We'll talk a little bit about that maybe a little bit later. But for now, I wanna go into the JavaScript code. And we have four files here. Uh, one of them is just package.json because this is a node app. And so you don't really wanna mess with that. I mean, you can always add other dependency libraries in there manually if you want, but you could also just use npm install to do the same thing. It's up to you what you feel most comfortable with. Um, local debugger. This file, I wish would just go away. Because at one time, it was, it was all that. Man, this is the thing I loved having in there. There's a better way now. And I'll show you what the better way is here in a minute. But this right now is just taking up space. And I wish they would get rid of it in the template. It even says it's deprecated right there. Yeah, it's just don't, don't worry about it, delete it. The first thing you're going to do is delete it. I'll leave it in there for tonight, but you're going to want to get rid of it. It's just going to be in the way. Util.js, this is giving you some, some convenience things so you can get a pre-signed URL to your S3 bucket uh, so you don't have to mess with that yourself. You just get a pre-signed URL so you can go fetch images or sound files or whatever you want from an S3 bucket. I'm not even going to use this. Uh, I wish this was something that they would add, let me add later instead of just giving it to me, assuming I'm going to use it, but I'm just going to leave it alone for now. The big thing I want to focus on is this one right here, index.js. 
This is where everything goes, unless you're a really good, clever JavaScript developer, and then you start extracting things out in the submodules, and you use the require to bring them in, which is the smart thing to do. I'm not going to do that tonight either, but you, it's a good idea, because otherwise this file is going to get huge. Okay, it's already pretty big. But we have, first off, we're bringing in the ask SDK core library as a dependency. We're assigning it to Alexa as a constant, and we're going to use that. We have a launch request handler, and I'll talk a little bit about that one in a minute. It's kind of special. We have hello world intent handler. We already kind of guessed what that might do. We have a help intent handler. We have a cancel and stop. Notice the naming of that one was clever enough. Uh, because if you look at how it's written, it's actually handling both cancel and stop as synonymous to each other. We have a fallback intent handler, we just never declared a fallback intent. So we don't even have to write the handler, we just have to go declare the fallback intent to make the fallback intent work. We have a session ended request handler, which is the opposite of launch. And we have an intent reflector handler. This is for debugging purposes only. Essentially what this one does is if nobody else matches if no other intent gets the job it'll come here and it's just for debugging purpose it'll just say hey you triggered this intent the idea here is it's not so much that you didn't declare an intent you may have declared the intent in your your interaction model but you forgot to write the handler for it and if that's what if that happens if i created a my favorite color intent and i declared that in the interaction model but forgot to write the handler and I said, I, I opened it up all proud, ready to go, and I said, my favorite color is red. And if, without a handler, it's not gonna know what to do with that. This, this'll get the job, and it'll just say, you just triggered favorite color intent. It'll, it'll log that, and it'll say it outside, or I'm sorry, it'll speak it, it doesn't log it, but it, it could, I suppose. And then down here, we have an error handler. The error handler, you can have as many error handlers as you want, but the default one handles every error. And it's just going to simply say, sorry, I had trouble doing what you asked. And so when you ever you hear that, sorry, I had trouble doing what you asked, that should be your clue that an exception was thrown out of one of the other handlers. And you're going to want to go in here and check this out. Maybe go look at the logs and see what was logged, things like that, for debugging purposes. And then down here, the last most important part, and you will, you're, if you're, you're going to be like me and you're going to forget to do this, you have to register your handlers down here with the skill builder. And so here you have to register them. Now the order that they appear up here isn't important. You can have them whatever order you want to appear. Down here it's very important. Because if there's any ambiguity, it's going to start with the launch request handler. And if that one can take the job, it'll take the job. If it can't, it's going to come onto this one. Then it'll go to this one, to this one. If I were to take and move intent reflector handler to the top, it will be the only one that handles anything because it's the only one that's going to get all the requests, because it's the way it's written, it's, it's written to handle everything. The idea is the ones above it are not written to handle everything. They're very specific, and so they'll get the job first. And if none of them say, yes, I'll take it, then Intent Reflector Handler deals it. Now, how does it know what the right, what the right thing is to do? Well, let's look at Launch Request Handler first. Launch Request Handler says, I can't make that any smaller, can I? A uh, launch request handler has a can handle and a handle function. If can handle returns true, then we're going to get it's going to get the job and it's going to go into the handle function to do the root, do whatever work needs to be done. So in this case it's saying, "Hey Alexa, what is the request type? Is the request a launch request? Then I will handle that. If it's not a launch request, I'm not going to handle it." Down here in Hello World Intent Handler, it says, okay, is this an intent request? And if it is an intent request, is it Hello World Intent? It's going to pull the intent name and the request type off the request. And if it's an intent request with Hello World Intent, then it's going to get the job. And then this will get called. And if you look down here at Intent Request Handler, it says, is it an intent request? It doesn't care what the intent name is. That's why this has to come after, down here in the registration at the bottom, it has to come after all the other intent handlers. Otherwise, it's going to return true regardless of what the name is. So, with that said, let me talk really briefly about the launch request. The launch request is special. Launch request is essentially, if you think of this as analogous to a website, this is the home page. It's going to say, when you say, Alexa, open, Denver open source, it's going to go there first. And it's going to leave the session open. And then you can say, say hello 
and then it'll go to the Hello World Intent Handler. So it's like you went to the home page and then you clicked on a link, but instead of clicking on anything, you went to the launch request and then you followed up with something else and it went to that, that intent handler. If I were to say, Alexa, ask Denver Open Source to say hello, it's gonna bypass the launch request and it's gonna go straight into this. So the idea here is you wanna be careful because it's tempting to think of this as a place where you might do some sort of like initialization of something, it's a bad idea because there's no guarantee the user is even going to come here. They might go straight into this by saying, ask Denver Open Source to say hello. Well, I'm going to go ahead and change this slightly so we have something to, that says something other than hello world. So I'm going to say, hello, mile high city. Just something different, OK? Something unique. Now let me talk about this reprompt real quick. You see it's commented out down here, but it's not up here. What this is is if, if the Alexa is going to say whatever this, whatever you pass into it. And here it's passing the same thing into both, but it doesn't have to. You could pass a different phrase into the reprompt. But she's going to say, welcome. You can say hello or help, which would you like to try? If the user is silent, she's going to leave the microphone on for the user to say something. If the user doesn't say anything after a few seconds, she's going to say the same thing again or whatever you pass in here. She's going to reprompt them. Down here, reprompt is commented out. I wish they would get rid of this too because it doesn't need to be there. It's annoying that they left it there. But regardless, she's going to say, hello, Maha City, and then the session will end, the microphone will be turned off, and she won't reprompt you. There's two ways to leave the microphone on. Either have a reprompt or set should end session to false. However, here's the important thing. Again, if you're doing this for yourself and you're never going to publish this, you're only developing it for your own use, do whatever you want. But if you want to publish it, you're going to fail certification if you leave the microphone on and you don't end with a question. The clue there is that the question is a clue to the user that you might be expecting them to come back and say something. If you simply make a statement, that's not a clue to the user that they should follow up and say anything. And so that's a no-no. They will not allow you to pass certification because that's a potential security concern. The user may s say something like, say hello, and it says, hello, Maha City. They think they're done, but the microphone's still on. And now Alexa's listening to everything that they're saying. And so, yeah, that's a no-no. Don't do that. They, you, will, you will fail certification if you do that. Again, if you're, not if you're not going through certification, if you're doing it for your own use, knock yourself out. Leave that microphone on. I don't care. But uh, Amazon's not going to allow you to do that for, for publishing. All right, so I've made a subtle change. I've added Hello Mile High City. Cool. All right. Doing horribly on time. Horribly. Just checking the, the time there. Yeah. I only have 15 minutes. Am I right? To cover everything. That's okay. We'll get to it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and do this. I made the changes. I'm going to say git add, because this is how you deploy when you're using Alexa hosted skills. Git commit, um, maybe you should say initial tweaks, and git push. Now, this is going to take a moment. Even though the git happens pretty quickly, it's going to take a moment for code commit to realize that there's a commit there and do the deploy. So the way you can find out about whether it's working or not is I'm going to go into, the, ah, come on developer.amazon.com, which is where you would sign up for a developer account if you haven't got one yet. And I'm going to go from there to developer console. You probably saw Mark Cuban there at the bottom of the screen for a moment. That's where you, another place you can find those that interview. But here we have, you already see it's been deployed, but this is from when I created it. It did a deployment when I first created it too. So I'm going to go in there, and if I go to build, and go to, come on, I shouldn't have clicked that, it was the same place, and go to interaction model, you're gonna see in here, it's gonna, well, maybe I zoom out, it's a little crowded right now. It's gonna see, you're gonna see something over here say building skill or building model or what are, building or something, I can't remember what it says, when it's building the interaction model, but right now it's not saying anything. So either it built it already, which I seriously doubt, or um, it hasn't picked it up yet. If I come over here to code, I can also edit my code here if I want to. I mean, you can use this as your IDE if you want to. I don't recommend it. 
I do it sometimes for like small, quick tweaks. But if you do make a change here, you have to go back to, and you don't want to go back and work at the command line, you have to do a git pull to get the latest stuff. Because it does create a new commit. But it says, um, it does say hello Maha City, so it did see that change. So that's there. Um, it looks like it hasn't deployed yet for some reason, but that's usually it does that automatically for me. Let's just see. Maybe I'm just being impatient with it. Let's go see if this is built yet. Well, the best thing to do to see if it picked it up is go see my invocation name, which is still change me. And this is the one of the annoying things that happens when I'm presenting this to a room full of people. It takes freaking forever. It doesn't seem to take this long when I'm doing it at home. But when people are watching me, it seems to take an, an enormous amount of time for it to pick this stuff up. So let me do a refresh. And if it doesn't do it on its own, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of cheat it a little bit. Yeah, I'll go ahead and change it to Denver open source because I'm, I'm, I'm just too impatient to wait for it. So I'm going to save it. I'm going to say build model. And it's going to do two kinds of builds. The invocation main name must not contain launch word. I'm sorry, what? Invocation name. Oh, open. It doesn't like that. That was probably why it didn't deploy now that I think of it. Well, that's horrible. Okay, Denver source. We're going to call it Denver source now. I didn't, I didn't even think of that. We're going to call it Denver source. It's a horrible name, but we'll go with that. Okay, so it's starting a build, and um, there, you're going to see this come up. It's going to say quick build complete, and then it'll say later on build complete. Quick build is just a very simple model uh, evaluation. So you almost don't, almost nothing matches. I mean, our, I'm sorry, it's not. It's just matching almost word for word your your sample utterances. The the quick the bigger one is it matches every it matches other stuff. But yes, go ahead. Can you overcome the box setting? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just it gets weird if I do, but yeah. Right. So quick build is successful. And then the bigger, the more complete one, build complete, this is where it's actually built the full model, and it's it's a little smarter by this time. You can start testing it after quick build, but it's just not gonna support everything at that point. It's going to be very limited of what it can do. My code should have deployed by now, but if not, just to be safe, I'm going to come over here and hit deploy. It usually doesn't take that long to deploy the Lambda code. So it's deployed. Cool. And then I can test it. Now I can test it by doing this. I hope. Alexa, open Denver source. Welcome. You can say hello or help. Which would you like to try? Hello. Hello, Mile High City. Isn't that awesome? I just created an Alexa skill. Now, I can also test it by going to the Test tab. And I can type in stuff. I can actually type it or I can talk to it by holding down this microphone button. I usually just type it, say, open Denver Source. It pains me that I actually had to use that name. Welcome. You can say he help. Which would you like to try? And then I can say, hi. Hello, Mile High City. Now, what's nice about using this tab, I'm going to have to zoom out a little bit. The details aren't important, so it's OK if you can't read it. Just want to show you what you can see. You can see the, the, the request, the JSON that was sent in as the request, and you can see the JSON that was sent back as the response. If you're testing for like a display, like an Echo Show, you can also see the Echo Show display. It's a little hard to see right now because I had to zoom in, zoom out. But if I were to publish this, you could actually hit my skill. Yep, totally. I'm not going to publish it, so don't try. But yeah, you could. But you can actually test your Alexa, your Echo Show, your APL stuff using this down here. And if things are just really being weird and not working for you, you can turn on the device log and you can see the actual what was sent from here to Alexa. Not to your skill, but from here to the, to the cloud that Alexa interpreted and then sent to your skill. But that's a device log. That's a much lower level. Every so often, I find myself needing to dig in there, but it's rare. So you, that's why it's not checked by default. You can also test it this way. You can say, ask dialogue. And you can say, open Denver source. Now, it's not going to talk. But you can still type to it. 
and read the responses. And you can say hello. And then you can do things like record and give it a name like um, hello, something like that. So it created a file called hello. And then I can quit. And if I go look at, whoops, dot quit. If I say look at hello, it's going to be a JSON file that has, at the end of the day, it's just telling it which skill to use and what to say to it. So it's just going to replay that as a script. So that's another way you could do it. You can also, if you're using v VS Code, you can come over here to the Alexa skills. You can say test skill, which by the way, that git deploy, I could have also done that entire thing through here. And say test. And I have a video that I just published nine days ago. Uh, I'll give you the link to that a little bit later. Uh, that shows all the stuff I'm showing you here. I can say open simulator. And again, zooming in like it, like this is, it looks weird, but just bear with me. I'll zoom out a little so we can kind of see it. I'm going to say open Denver source. Did I click it? I don't know. It may just be zoomed out weird. Let me see what I can see if I zoom all the way out. Yeah, open, Den oh, I thought it gave me a default, but it didn't. Okay. There it is. So it says welcome. You can say or hello or help. It's not talking, but I can still test it that way. And I can say hello. So you can do this all in VS Code if you want. In fact, on that video, I'm going to send you a link or give you a link to a little bit later. I show you three different ways of developing Alexa skills. One of them, you never leave VS Code at any point. You do everything in VS Code. Um, so that's, there's some options there. Let's talk about if I wanted to make a change now. What if I didn't want it to say, didn't say hello, Maha City? Well, first, I did make some changes, so I do need to do a git pull to make sure I have the latest stuff. Well, it says it's already up to date. The interaction model is a little iffy for me on how that gets dealt with when I make changes out there versus local. If it was the, the JavaScript code, definitely if I made a change on the browser, I'd have to do a git pull to pull it. Regardless, I'm going to make a change now. I'm going to make a really simple change. And instead of saying Mile High City, I'm going to say um, welcome, maybe I can say the whole name here, Denver Open Source User Group. Now, what, am I, what do I have to do to try this now? You should know by now. I have to do a git push, right? And I have to wait for it to pick it up, right? And that's annoying because I'm creating all these commits for something I don't even know it's going to work yet. I have to wait for it. What a pain in the butt. I don't want to do that. I'm terribly impatient. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do this. I'm going to say ask run. Now this is not going to work the first time, because, but it's going to remind me what I need to do to make it work. I need to say ask install prefix, because it's I need to put it in the Lambda directory. Save dev, because it's a development dependency I'm adding, not something that's going to be deployed. Ask SDK local debug. And it's not ask, it's NPM because I'm not thinking clearly. NPM install, prefix lambda, save dev, ask SDK local debug. Great, that's in there now. Now ask run. This is so awesome. But I'm also going to throw in there ask run watch. Watch this. I didn't deploy it, did I? Watch what happens. I'm going to come over here. I'll kind of clear my, my, my screen by saying refresh. I'm going to say open Denver source. Welcome. You can say hello or help. Which would you like to try? Hello, Denver open source user group. I never deployed it. And hey, wait, here's something cool. Maybe I want to say Hi there instead. I'm going to hit save. I'm going to do it again. Welcome. You can say hello. Hi there, Denver Open Source User Group. See how quick that was? It's all running locally now. I have basically, by saying ask run, I told Alexa, redirect those requests to my machine. Isn't that awesome? Now, I don't have time to go into it now, but you can also do essentially the same thing. And if you're using, it'll, it'll work in other editors too. I know it works 
in a handful of other editors, but I definitely know it works in VS Code. I could even set breakpoints and de debug through my code. Isn't that awesome? It totally is awesome. All right, now what I wanted to do is show you a billion other things, but I'm almost at a, in fact, I'm essentially out of time, but let me show you one more thing. Bear with me, it's only take a second. I have created, because I, I feel like I'm missing something if I don't at least show you how to do slots. I won't have time to go into dialogues, but at least slots, okay? So I'm gonna add a, a, a new intent. Now I have all these little um, templates, these little snippets in VS Code that, so I don't have to type everything all the time. I'm gonna say favorite color intent, and I'm gonna say my favorite color is, and here's how you give it a give it a slot, color. And you can have as many slots as you want in, in an utterance. I'm only gonna have one, because I don't have time to build anything fancier, but you can have as many as you want. You can say, I hate it how sometimes the editor does that. You can say color is my favorite. You can say, I like color, and color is the slot. It's a parameter whose name is color. Well, I have to go spec. I have to go declare that, and the way I declare that is, actually, I'll just do it manually. I don't think I have a snippet for that one. The name is color. If you don't declare it here, you're going to get an error when you deploy. So I'm going to go. Ahead, you have to be sure and do that, and you have to give it a type. Now you can create custom types. That's outside the scope of the time we have. But Amazon has a rich set of types you can draw from, one of which is Amazon.color, which is what I want. And this has nothing to do, at least it, by default, it has nothing to do with validation. If it asks for a color, if the slot is a color type and I say puppy, it'll still take puppy. Now the answer it gives me is in the, in the, in the request, it's gonna give me puppy, but it's also gonna give me some indication that that really wasn't what I was expecting. It didn't quite match, but it'll still give it to me. Um, it's really more for clarification purposes. It's, it's more for if the user says something that is ambiguous. It could be a co color, it could be an animal, it could be a city, it could be something else. And it, either the user ha maybe has an accent or didn't speak clearly or it's too quiet, or maybe it really is a word that could be ambiguous. It's just this, this, this type is to help her know what you meant. You're expecting a color, so if you say something, if you say tangerine, you don't mean fruit, you mean color, okay? That, that's what this means. It's, it's just helping her understand you didn't mean a fruit, you meant a color, even if you said tangerine, okay? That's all it's helping her do, is understand the meaning of the word. So, I've added that. Over here, I'm gonna add an intent handler. Again, I have all sorts of really cool things for that. Uh, favorite color intent handler, and notice it filled in my, the blanks for me, and I'm just gonna simply say, um, how do I do it? get slot value? Um, that's not what I wanted. Get slot value, that one, color, and I'm gonna say, using the back ticks, I'm gonna say, I like color two. There we go. There, I've just added some functionality to it. Now here's the thing, I can't just deploy this. I mean, I can't use the ask run to, to try this out because ask run is only running my Lambda code locally, my JavaScript code locally. It's not rebuilding the interaction model. So I have to come back to the command line. I have to get out of this. I have to say, I have to do a git add, git commit, and get push. And we're gonna have to wait a second. That'll give me a chance to talk through the last few of my slides and we'll come back and try it out. Um, but I have to do this to get the interaction model out there. Have to. I am a little worried that it might not work because I did make some manual changes to the interaction model out on the, through the developer console, but maybe it'll work, we'll wait and see. But before we, before we try it out, I'll wrap up with a few closing thoughts and as soon as I figure out where Keynote went, there it is. So, here's a good chance for you to take a screenshot or pull out your phone and take a picture. Check out my books, they make great gifts. Mother's Day is gonna be only a few months away. My mom liked, liked the ones I gave her. So, 
Okay. So there's a, a link for the bill talking apps. Okay. I don't know when it's going to be released. <laughs> I have literally, I, I need to review some index entries and I'm done. So, I, I mean, it, it's essentially all but done. No, Manning, Manning publishes my spring book. Prag, Pragmatic Bookshelf publishes uh, the, the Alexa book. But I'm also a spring developer, so if you're interested in that, I also wrote Spring in Action. The sixth edition is now available, both on Amazon and at your favorite bookstores, manning.com, things like that. Check out my videos. There's a link there at the bottom, and I'm sorry the link is convoluted. And I don't have a short version of it, so this is where you do want to take a screenshot. Um, or I can also make it available to you to distribute later on, perhaps. Um, but yeah, that, there's actually two videos out there right now. One is showing how to do a lot of this debugging and using a back-end system with Spring. Uh, the other one is showing you the three different ways of developing a, an Alexa skill. And then on Slack, this is not me on Slack, this is the Amazon team, design.alexa.com slash Slack. That's where you're gonna wanna go. I spend some time out there myself though. Um, but the Amazon <laughs> Alexa team, a lot of their folks are out there as well. They'll answer questions, the community's out there. It's a great group of people. Uh, you'll wanna check that out. And with that said, I, I'll take some questions after I go check to see if this is working. And then we'll call it done. And as I said, I kept my promise. I wanted to cover everything, and I failed. And I, I, I was expecting that, that's okay. But let's go see if this picked it up and deployed it and we'll try it out. I'll know when I go to the interaction model and it says, <laughs> it didn't pick it up for some reason. Let's go try one more thing. All right, favorite color intent's not there, but I know how to make it go there. I'll show you this trick. Copy this. Go to interaction model, JSON editor, paste it in there. And I have to take that out, otherwise that won't work. That may have been why it didn't deploy, because I never changed it locally. And then I hate how they don't support the command keys for saving. I'll do a build. While it's doing the build, let's come over here and check out my code. Did it pick up my favorite color and tin handler? It did, but I just realized I forgot something. I forgot to do this. So I'll do that now and deploy it. And now, once it's ready, we'll do it with a real device for full effect. Alexa, open Denver Source. Welcome. You can say hello or help. Which would you like to try? My favorite color is blue. I like blue too. <laughs> it works. Awesome. Now the only thing I would like to, if I had more time I'd go into, is dialogues would essentially, if I said, I want to plan a trip, she would say, where do you want to go? When do you want to leave? When do you want to return? She could, the dialogue would walk you through that, that, that whole conversation to get that information. And then if I had like three more hours, we could talk about Alexa conversations, which does that same thing, but just smarter. But I'm out of time. I'm out of stuff I can adequately cover in the, time, in what, in the negative amount of time we have. So I'm going to call it done. So thank you very much. Any questions? Thanks, Denver. Yeah, thank you. And now I'm going to drive out of Denver to Castle Rock. What? A lot of what I didn't cover is in the book. And here's the sad thing. I, I, this only covered, what I covered tonight really is the first two chapters. No, three chapters. No, chapter one and chapter three. I didn't cover any testing, really. Chapter two covers testing. And there's some really cool testing tools. Uh, two of them in particular I cover in the book that allow you to test without even deploying. It'll, it'll do everything locally. It's really cool. Um, there's, we yeah, but basically, Hello World and Slots are chapters one and three, and then after that we go into dialogues, we go into APL, APLA, SSML, we talk about publishing at some point, we talk about doing in-scale purchasing so you can make money, all that stuff. And the book covers a lot, like, like I covered maybe ten, five to 10% of what I, the book covers, I covered that tonight. Guess what? There's a, like another, almost twice as much that I just didn't make it into the book. I just didn't get it in there. because, And so there's a crap ton of stuff I'd love to have covered. Um, and, the, and the thing is, by the time I, if I did cover it, 
tomorrow, there would be brand new stuff because it's an always evolving and there's always new cool stuff coming along. I love your presentations. Thank you for coming out. I think this was just the right amount for you know something like this. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. See ya. Hold on, Mish. Don't go away.